It might be a more common health problem than you think. Tonight, treating irritable bowel syndrome, plus polishing up the nail care industry. This is Newsnight Maryland. Good evening, everyone. Between 10 and 15 percent of Americans live with the frustration and discomfort of an incurable digestive disorder, better known as irritable bowel syndrome. Its cause is unknown. For many, the symptoms have a severe effect on the quality of life and treatments aren't fully effective. And now, the potential side effects of a promising new medication have prompted warnings from the Food and Drug Administration. On tonight's Maryland Discoveries, coping with irritable bowel syndrome. Most of us don't spend a lot of time thinking about what we eat, but for people with irritable bowel syndrome, everyday dietary decisions are very important. IBS is the most common intestinal disorder, accounting for more than half of the patients seen by gastroenterologists like Dr. Ted Bayless at Johns Hopkins. Those people who come to the physician uh, complain, come complaining of abdominal pain, distension late in the afternoon, uh, cramping, irregularity of their bowel habits, diarrhea one day, constipation another. I think pain is probably the main thing that brings people to the physician. Dr. Bayless says diagnosing IBS isn't particularly difficult, but it can take time. Often, an examination of the colon with a sigmoidoscope will help define the disorder. The diagnosis is basically arrived at by eliminating the possibility of other diseases, such as Crohn's, inflammatory bowel disease, and cancer. IBS affects twice as many women as men. It usually begins in early or middle adulthood, and there is strong evidence that it is triggered by a combination of physical and psychological conditions. The stress certainly brings on the symptoms. It doesn't cause the symptoms. This is not, quote, all in people's heads. They have this basic wiring diagram of their gut that is altered. But yes, stressful times will uh, bring out the symptoms more readily. And it, for someone will have symptoms Things will quiet down, they'll change jobs, they'll get engaged, they'll get divorced. Things that happen, that may then bring this out for a number of months. Dietary changes, fiber, and medications are helpful in treating IBS, but there is no known cure. In the past two weeks, the Food and Drug Administration has issued a warning about the possible side effects of one new medicine, Lotronex. It's designed to help women with persistent diarrhea. In a handful of cases, women on the drug have developed severe intestinal inflammation. There have been some very rare complications of ischemia, of damage to the colon with that product that's not very common. So uh, that has been a nice advance for women who have a lot of cramps and diarrhea. Last week, the consumer watchdog group Public Citizen called on the FDA to take Lotronex off the market. Because the symptoms of IBS wax and wane with time and circumstance, Dr. Bayless believes some physicians underestimate the distress it can cause. I think doctors in general don't uh, pay as much attention to it, uh, perhaps. And there was a survey recently from uh, Los Angeles in which they found that most of the doctors tended to underestimate how severely uh, incapacitated some patients were. They tend to underestimate the pain people were having and how much of a bother this was to them. So I think that uh, physicians in general don't perhaps maybe not take this as seriously uh, as the patient does. In the studio with us now are Dr. David Posner, the Chief of Gastroenterology at Mercy Medical Center, Dr. Ted Bayless, Professor of Gastroenterology at Johns Hopkins School of Medicine, and Heather Van Voris, author of Eating for IBS. And you can call us with a question or comment. The number will be on the screen. Welcome to you all. Dr. Posner, does this uh, Lotronex issue uh, trouble you at all? It troubles me a little bit, but it's the same as most brand new drugs. Um, most of the important side effects have already been found, but there are going to be some side effects that will come out when it's in more common use. Dr. Bayless, uh, some are calling for it to be removed from the market. What would you think of that? I think that that's an overreaction. Uh, there are certainly people who become quite constipated on the product, but usually those are people who have had that problem anyway. anyway. And uh, no, I think that, uh, as Dr. Posner was alluding to the fact, 
that as new drugs come along, we have to find out which patients will really be most aided by it. So no, I think it's premature to ask for it to be removed. I think that you have to sort out people who are constipated beforehand or will have other illnesses which might interact. Heather, how old were you when you developed IBS? I was nine, although I was not diagnosed until I was almost 16. Um, unfortunately, I was taken to a pediatrician who told me there was nothing wrong with me. The problem was all in my head. Um, she actually refused to send me for diagnostic tests because the symptoms didn't fit anything that she had ever heard of, although I found out later I was a textbook case of IBS. So um, I lived with it for seven years, having no idea what was wrong with me. How did it affect the quality of your life? Um, at times, <laughs> pretty severely. The, the pain can be absolutely incapacitating. I've actually passed out from the pain um, quite a few times. Do you still have problems from time to time? I do occasionally. Um, I can keep the problems under control with diet, I would say, more than 90% of the time. I'm down to maybe several severe attacks a year, whereas if I didn't eat properly, I would be sick every single day. Really? I, absolutely. I wouldn't be here today. I think that's a fairly common scenario. I think most patients eventually adapt to the disease and have much less trouble with it than they do when they first come to see their physicians, assuming they come to see physicians because many of the patients who have this problem don't go to the, see the doctor at all. But they eventually learn that this is something which is going to be a chronic problem and they'll have attacks from time to time, but they learn to identify what is an attack and they understand that it'll go away by itself usually and that some of the attacks will be mild, some will be severe, but that they, they aren't going to have a lot of trouble and it's not going to be a severe, life-threatening health problem in the future. And that's a major part of the issue. One of the things that surprised me was how common this is. I had no idea that there were that many people who had it. It's one of the two most common problems that I see in the clinical gastroenterology practice. Same for you, Dr. Bayless? Yeah, we had Dr. Posner and I, again, were speaking and uh, Gastroenterologists, at least a third to a half of the patients who come to a gastroenterologist have irritable bowel syndrome as at least one of their problems. Among internists, those who do internal medicine or primary care, at least 10% of their patients will have this as a problem. 5% uh, it's the major problem. Do the symptoms vary a lot from person to person? Yes, certainly. I think that there is a general pattern, just as uh, was just described uh, a moment ago. There is a general pattern that most physicians, if they take the time, will recognize. Uh, and people will be affected in varying degrees, depending, as was just said, what the diet was, what they've just eaten, uh, how much stress they're under, what their life situation is. So I think that, yes, there is a rather common pattern, but it's influenced by what's happening around people, what they're eating, uh, and other things. Heather, what foods did you find over your uh, experience with this and in, in the writing of your book and researching it that you found were uh, troublesome and that you found were helpful? I found, after a long time, <laughs> that it basically comes down to sort of three specific categories, fats, insoluble fiber, and soluble fiber. And um, all three of those categories of foods have very specific effects on the GI tract. Um, they can either soothe it and regulate the contractions, or they can, um, they're stimulants. And fat is one of the strongest GI tract stimulants, and soluble fiber is a stimulant as well. So it speeds up the contraction um, of the muscles within the GI tract. For people with IBS, it can lead to blinding attacks of pain, severe diarrhea. Soluble fiber, on the other hand, is very soothing. It regulates the contractions, and that's what I found I really have to base my diet on. Give us an example of a soluble fiber soluble and insoluble. Fiber, it's things that people think of as starches. It's actually potatoes, rice, pasta, French or sourdough bread, oatmeal. Um, things that most people wouldn't say are fiber at all, but they are. They're soluble fiber. Insoluble fiber is what people think of typically as fiber. Bran, whole, whole grains, um, whole wheat, raw fruits, raw vegetables, the roughage types of foods. And although they're obviously extremely good for your health, they can also trigger really severe problems in people with IBS. I'm, I'm wondering whether or not a person is sort of condemned to a really bland diet then? No, <laughs> no way. Um, I love to eat. I absolutely get out of bed in the morning to eat breakfast. And I, I really, I would not eat food that wasn't good. And I eat better than pretty much everybody I know. Everything from banana cream pie to New England clean chowder to Cajun food, Mexican food, spicy food, ethnic food, American food. Everything can really be safely adapted to IBS as long as you have a so high soluble fiber base, you minimize the fat, um, dairy is a trigger for many people, but you can use soy or rice substitutes, and you add insoluble fiber to a soluble fiber base, so you incorporate the fruits and vegetables with the soluble fiber. 
if you think about what Heather's saying, she's actually talking about a generally healthy diet anyway. This isn't a diet which is unhealthy in any other way. It's a low-fat, high-fiber diet with a mixture of soluble and insoluble fiber. And that's what we recommend people eat for all kinds of health. Dr. Bayless, you spoke to me when, when I was interviewing you at your office about, um, you described this as sort of the body being wired differently for people with IBS. Explain that, would you? Well, I think ordinarily, the colon, the large intestine, which is the organ that causes most of the problems, uh, has a job of taking a quart of fluid every day and dehydrating it, holding onto it for 24 hours and dehydrating it to five ounces. So it takes 32 ounces and dehydrates it down to five ounces. And 90% of the world who don't have irritable bowel go to the bathroom once a day. They get up in the morning, eat breakfast, and that stimulus, whether it be fat in the meal or the large meal, they then, the colon empties. But it's the fat in the meal uh, that gives that stimulus for the portion of the colon to empty. So just as Heather said, the fat in the meal sends a message through the bloodstream to the left side of the colon to contract. And in healthy people who don't have irritable bowel, that's fine. They're done for the day. People with irritable bowel syndrome, as you said, have a different wiring diagram. They hold on to this quart of fluid longer. So with very strong muscles, and they get little bits of stool. They can't get rid of that. It stays longer. The gut protects itself with mucus or phlegm around the bowel. And then when they eat this large meal or fast food that is very greasy, the stimulus comes to this left side of the colon. It contracts tremendously. Now, as they've eaten, everything starts to move. Once we start to eat, what's ever in our stomach <coughs> moves, whatever in our small bowel moves, and the material moves through our colon. And if that valve, if you will, that area at the lower portion contracts very strongly, it either ejects the material, people have diarrhea, or it backs up and people have the pain that Heather spoke of, this cramping pain. So in order to avoid that, one wants the bowel to empty regularly uh, with whatever it takes to do that. Uh, and one wants to avoid stimuli that will cause that left colon to contract, which would be fatty meals. Let's take and a phone call here for a second, okay. if you don't mind. Um, Carol is on the line from Prince William County, Virginia. Hello, Carol. Hi. Um, I have a question. How is this diagnosed? Is it a process of elimination? I mean, if you, not to be funny, but, right. um, but it, you know, if, if you've had the, um, inspected the colon and there's nothing wrong and you still have symptoms like this and also is it kind of like a two-part question how does this differ also from Crohn's disease which is a, a another intestinal disease that a friend of mine has had. Thanks Carol. Uh, Dr. Posner? Well one of the features of irritable bowel syndrome is that all the tests come back looking normal so that an endoscopy or a colonoscopy will show normal appearing stomach or upper intestine or lower intestine blood tests all look normal. That's one of the features of this. If the blood tests are not normal or someone does an x-ray of the intestine or a colonoscopy and finds evidence of Crohn's disease, then irritable bowel syndrome is not the diagnosis. It may still be part of it, but it's not the entire diagnosis. Um, one of the things that you said, which many people say is, well, if I look in the intestine and it looks normal, then there's really nothing wrong. That's not true. You still have symptoms. You still have something wrong. The tests look normal. That may be a manifestation of our inability to diagnose exactly what's going on because we don't know exactly what's wrong in irritable bowel syndrome. But you still have the symptoms. You still have the diarrhea. You still have the pain. Can, I, can IBS lead to any other kind of uh, intestinal problem? Well, IBS is associated with the presence of diverticula, which are small pouches in the large intestine. Whether it leads to them or not, I think is, is something one can argue, but it probably does. But it's not associated with cancer. It's not associated with inflammatory bowel disease, such as ulcerative colitis and Crohn's disease. It doesn't shorten <coughs> one's life, although it makes one very unhappy while, it's, uh, while there's an attack going on. I think I'd add. <clears throat> to try to answer the question that the lady posed is that what symptoms don't fit with irritable bowel? Why should she be worried? Well, the symptoms that don't fit with irritable bowel are waking up at night with diarrhea repeatedly. That's not part of irritable bowel. Losing a lot of weight is not part of irritable bowel, unless the person is obviously depressed. Uh, bleeding. Now, obviously, people get blood on their stool from hemorrhoids or things like that, but having, becoming anemic, those are not things that fit. And then the various blood tests that Dr. Posner spoke of. But I think that 
uh, there are certain red flags that the physician is looking for. He's not going to call someone irritable bowel syndrome whose symptoms start at 50 or 60. Uh, because most people with irritable bowel start in teenage or in their 20s. So, so does it resolve over, with time, over age? Not resolve, it's that the tendency is there, but what people do in terms of what goes on around them, at, or also, as was just said, what their dietary intake is, what their life situation is, those things vary. So they may be asymptomatic for years and they start a new job. Lisa, when, how long did it take for you to find the right combination that worked for you? It took me probably about 10 years to figure out what foods caused problems and what foods didn't. It took probably another five years of reading extensively on top of that to realize why those foods had the effects they did. I knew that I couldn't eat greasy foods. I knew that I couldn't eat meat or dairy. And I knew that there was this other weird category of foods like raw green salads, bean sprouts, popcorn, things that obviously weren't high in fat, but they all seemed to have something in common that made me sick. It wasn't until I came across in my early 20s the difference between soluble and insoluble fiber that I realized, oh, no wonder, here's these clear-cut categories of foods, and suddenly all the pieces sort of came together. And I also realized why my safe foods were things like French bread and rice and pasta, why those were my staples. Why, were you malnourished when you were, before you found the right food combination? Um, no, not at all. Um, there's. I, I eat great. I always did. I was fortunate to be raised in a family where I'm from Seattle. We ate a lot of fish. Fish is not a trigger. I never liked meat. I never liked milk. So I was sort of avoiding those even before I had IBS. Um, things like fresh fruits and fresh vegetables, if they're cooked, uh, which a lot of people have f for dinner in a cooked form, they're a lot more easy to tolerate. And I was also cooking from a very early age and learning how to bake and, and how to make foods that had to be safe or I couldn't eat them. So. So a person who does have IBS is not in danger of being malnourished? You, you'd said that, that uh, an individual wouldn't be anemic, is that right? That's correct. No, I think that people can become malnourished if they go on a very restricted diet, if people don't realize what foods it is that are a problem, mm -hmm. or they uh, get off into a particularly very restricted diet and say, all I can eat are X, Y, and Z because everything else I touch gives me a problem. And this is often misguided, but I think people can get into malnutrition or at least poor uh, digestive habits by over-restricting their diet. I've heard from a lot of people who have lost a lot of weight because they are afraid to eat. They, they don't know why they eat, they get sick, and they can't figure out. Well, there's no rhyme or reason to it because they don't understand the different categories of food and why things stimulate them or help yeah, them. I, I would second that. I think that uh, I, I see a fair number of patients in whom they have eliminated, self-eliminated almost everything and are existing on bread and water. And it takes a fair amount of persuasion to get them to put important nutritious foods back in the diet. Uh, but it's important to do because a very restrictive diet will cause a lot of weight loss. You had mentioned dairy products as being a trigger. Is that a common one? It seems to be extremely common. And a lot of people are tested for lactose intolerance. Right. They find out they're not lactose intolerant. I'm not. It doesn't matter. Dairy can still be a trigger. First of all, it's extremely high in fat. Um, and it can also have other components like casein and whey that causes problems for people. It tends to be just something that's very difficult for people to digest. And since it can really be pretty easily eliminated in all sorts of cooking by using soy or rice milk instead, it's something that most people find they're a lot better off without. They just eliminate it and they are so much healthier as a result. I'm interested in finding out from you two doctors about what you, what you would say is the sort of the success rate that you would have with uh, people who come in and, and you know, in managing. IBS is, is it, do you find it really manageable after, after you sort of fine tune this individual's life? Or well, I think that the tendency never goes away, but I think we can make people much more comfortable if we take the time to one, explain the syndrome to them and what the cause of their symptoms are, why a fatty meal does this, or why gassy foods make people uncomfortable. And if you can explain to people what the cause of their symptoms are, I think this is helpful. Uh, you reassure them by doing the tests that uh, Dr. Posner spoke of, that they don't have cancer, that's what most people are concerned about. Sure. And once you've done that, I think that you can help a lot of people. Now, do they come back again in five years with the same symptoms? Often they do, uh, but I think my impression is that I think I've helped a fair number of people by taking the time to explain it, giving them dietary suggestions, setting up a regular follow-up visit. Let me, uh, let me get a, another phone call in real fast. Francis from Montgomery County. Hello, Francis. Hello. Uh, I uh, have a problem with uh, Heather's diet. 
I have been told that I cannot have any spices, I cannot have fried food, and I found that I can't have onion or anything in the onion family. I can't have anything in the cabbage family or spinach. In other words, my diet is very, very bland. Yeah. And uh, every now and then I do uh, go off the diet and willing to take the consequences, which is diarrhea. I rarely ever have any pain. All right, Francis, thank you very much. Um, She's been given very common advice, and a lot of people with IBS think that spicy foods are a trigger and will make them sick. It's typically not the spices. It's typically the spicy foods are very high in fat. People are eating things like chili and like tacos. They're based on ground beef, which is a trigger for almost everyone. They're based, um, they have a lot of oil added to them, and it's the fat that's causing problems. It's not the spices. If they eat something like a low-fat um, seafood fajita, for instance, that's spicy, a lot of times they have no problems at all. It might be specific red pepper spices that have capsicum, which can be a GI tract irritant. But herbs and spices as a whole are not triggers, and a lot of them, ginger and peppermint, fennel, chamomile, can be very beneficial. When does your book come out? October 30th. There's October. a website for it. There's an eatingforibs.com website where people can view pretty much the whole entire text, see a lot of the recipes, and hopefully get some help. Thank you all very much for joining us this evening. Thank you. Next Tuesday on Maryland.